up? We are your internet historians, and in today's episode, we will be discussing the history behind the movie Wind Talkers. Marine Joe Enders is assigned to protect Ben Yazi, a Navajo code talker, the Marine's new secret weapon. Enders' orders are to protect his code talker, but if Yazi should fall into enemy hands, he's to protect the code at all costs. Against the backdrop of the horrific Battle of Saipan, when capture is imminent, Enders is forced to make a decision. If he can't protect his fellow Marine, can he bring himself to kill him to protect the code? Mm, so, dun, dun, dun. what would what what do you guys think of this this movie? I didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was, who's I the have person, a, who suggested we watch it? Not to call you me. out, but okay, okay, <laughs> Nicole. Okay, I liked this movie a lot when I was like in high school. I don't mm-hmm. know why. I just really liked it, and then watching it back, I realized my mistake in my like for this movie. I just remember being enthralled with it when I was younger. I think because I never heard the story. So I was very interested in the story of who the code talkers were. But this time when I watched it, I legit felt bored. They left a lot to be desired when it came to the story of the code talkers. Um, I feel like it wasn't really about them. It was about the Joe Enders character and his like battle, yes mm-hmm. internal battle of like, can I kill this person? Like, I am so traumatized from this whatever thing that I held. So I'm like, what is this? Story? Like, they, I feel like they tricked everybody. They said wind talkers and all this stuff in the title, but then they're like, actually, it's about Nicholas's Cage character and, mm-hmm. yeah, and Nicholas Cage single handedly yeah. winning World War Two exactly and <laughs> and like his bravery and. and in sacrificing himself the guy adam beach the guy who played ben he is um native he's first native Nations. american yeah he's well, that's the canadian yeah, he's um, canadian but yeah. he so i respected that and the guy who played white horse he can actually speak navajo fluently so that was something i was like you know me, I'm always looking to the actors. I'm over here like, do they just cast some, you know? I was wondering about that too because I like looked into it because I just saw that he was from New Mexico. They didn't really t- say too much about him because he hasn't really been in much as far as I could tell, but Adam Adam Beach has. And I was just like, okay, well, I'm glad that they actually like cast the correct people <laughs> for this exactly. role. And especially because Indigenous Peoples Day was recently and I I watched a, on, on BuzzFeed, I watched a couple um, videos of like Native people like reacting to portrayals in movies and TV and a lot of the time it's just like that person isn't even Native American. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, whatever. But yeah. So yeah, that's what I was definitely interested in. And this movie is older, 2002. 2002. Yep. So it's it's like I can totally see them casting whoever they wanted to cast, but they didn't, which is nice. My feelings on this movie, yeah, I don't know. It's just it's it's rough because I feel like, and then what was it was two thousand five for Amityville Horror. I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's just like I don't know if it's just like a sign of the times again, like early two thousands movies, and I just like cannot get behind them anymore because I'm like so I don't know jaded with movies these days, and especially like war movies. I don't know. Nineteen seventeen came out, and I'm like all about nineteen seventeen. I mean, that's the first right? World War, but like, oh my god, I love that movie. The movie till was the day so- I die awesome it's so good i would love to watch that for it episode. <laughs> it was just a beautiful movie too but it really was <laughs> so it's just like coming into this and i'm and i'm not a like a, any means a war epic person at all so like it, it really said something that i thoroughly enjoyed 1917 and so coming in and watching this movie i was just like like you said i felt kind of bored in some um parts but like what did it for me was the score which funny it's the same composer that did Titanic. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, but, but yeah, what did it for me was the music. Like, it was just, especially in the beginning, like, the first five minutes just felt so over the top. Like, like I, I like, they're trying to set up Nicholas's, Nicholas Cage's characters, like, PTSD with his last mission and all of that. But, like, for what was going on in the scene, the music was just way too overwhelming, and it seemed like they were really trying to push the war epic, and it just wasn't there action-wise, and it just felt silly, and it just really took you out of the scene. I was just so, like, a lot of the times, like, the music and stuff, it's just, like, it doesn't go. Like, I'm sorry. Like, Titanic was good. The music was perfect for Titanic, but for, like, the way that they, and, like... (laughs) 
<laughs> I was reading a couple art, a couple reviews too, and people people said even just like which I didn't notice until like I was like halfway in because I kind of paused it and went back and all that, but uh, that whenever people would like get shot and stuff, they would like scream and like fall down, which I didn't even <laughs> notice. <laughs> and then I was just like, that's just ridiculous. I don't know if that's how people really die. <laughs> I don't know. It was just over the top. I hated that scene where they were trying to capture a white horse and the Japanese guys are like screaming. I'm like, okay, like they're not like at least hire people who can speak the language. So because I doubt they're like, like that's literally what it sounded like. And then white horses, they're like nodding. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. I I was just going to say that. I was like, that was kind of weird because I forget the guy who's white horses, like bodyguard. I forget his name. Um, Christian Slater. I know, but what was his like? And Ox Henderson. No, Christian Slater. His name was Ox. No, I know Christian Slater, but I don't remember his character's name. Anyway, yeah, um, yeah, Cox. Okay, and so it was funny because when he pulled out the gun, he's like, "I can't let them take us." And then um, White Horse is like, "What are you talking about?" Or whatever, right? And then he dies. uh, Cox dies. And then in the next scene, he's captured. In a brutal way. I know. And then I like how they had a pan over to his head, like, "Oh, in case you missed it, this is what happened to him." But anyways, and I just thought it was funny that he was like, obviously, didn't want cox to shoot him but then in the next scene he's being captured and then he's like shaking his head to nick cage and i'm like oh, okay so he's shaking his head so that makes it okay now let's go ahead yeah and that yeah i couldn't tell if that's what was really happening like i, I was like if they're really trying to convey that white horse was okay and knew that it had to happen or like what they were trying to con- like it was like a lot of eye contact or whatever but i will say that like once they they actually got into it and did have the guys on and got into them, it did get better. I feel like it, it, you started to actually, I guess, feel emotion out of Nicolas Cage and the characters because it, it's just, I don't know. I, I have mixed feelings about Nicolas Cage's acting, in, but at the beginning, it just wasn't believable. And then as it got into it, you actually, actually felt like the bond between the characters. And you're like, okay, they actually care about these guys, which was the problem. I him, technically so uh, it got more believable i feel like they tried to insert some type of commentary too on war in general when they were i believe they were walking in the mine field or right after the whole i forget what scene but it basically they're walking that one guy that was the one who was like i'm confusing you for japanese dude or whatever that guy when he was like oh who's Ick. to think like one day we might be having um conversations are sitting across from a Japanese and drinking their sake and all that stuff so I'm like okay so now you guys are trying to make a commentary on something like okay like it's just they're all over the place it actually kind of made me like almost physically mad that chick the the racist guy was having that realization which was a completely like valid thought and then Nicolas Cage's character just basically just shrugs it off it's like no don't tell people that are having a good realization that they shouldn't be racist and don't tell people don't think like basically it's just like sometimes you overthink things it's just like no <laughs> then how will he ever change <laughs> it made me so mad but okay, so since obviously we have a, a lot of things, <laughs> opinions on stuff or things that we felt that were left out of this whole movie. Mm-hmm. So basically, that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be kind of going into some of the things we thought they maybe should have elaborated on. So first, we're going to be talking about the Navajo Code, how they were came to be used in the war. So the United States obviously wanted to send coded messages without getting caught or discovered what they're saying to each other. And what they discovered the best way to do that with is using the Native Americans' languages. So the Cherokee language is the first known use of code talkers in the U.S. military during World War I. Cherokee soldiers of the U.S. 30th Infantry Division fluent in Cherokee language were assigned to transmit messages while under fire during the Second Battle of the Samoan. So sorry, <laughs> I don't know how to. I'm gonna butcher a lot of names, and I'm really sorry about that. Uh, the United States used many different tribes or in their languages as code talkers, not just the Cherokee and Na- Navajo people. The enemies did find out about it, and the German authorities knew about the use of code talkers during World War One, and sent a, sent a team of thirty anthropologists to the U.S. to learn the Native American language before the outbreak of World War Two. But the task proved to be too difficult because of the array of native languages and the dialects. The U.S. team did learn of the Nazis' efforts to learn the language and scaled back on the number of code talkers, with just a total of fourteen code talkers using the. Kamachi language 
uh, taking the part in the invasion of Normandy. So Navajo came to become one of the more notorious languages used for code talkers because even though the Germans failed to learn any Native American languages, enemies did try to learn and learn some words. So even though the U.S. may still be able to get away with code messages, they were still looking for something that proved to be harder for the enemies to decipher. And that's when Navajo steps in. It has a complex grammar. It's not mutually intangible enough, even though it's closest relatives with the Nadine family to provide meaningful information. At the time, Navajo still was an unwritten language. And that's what I kind of, when I was watching like a bunch of YouTube videos about it. It's like, it's an unwritten language. It's an unwritten language. So even if, um, I guess, Cherokee, I guess, if you try to like listen to it and you try to like phonetically write it out, maybe you can figure it out versus Navajo, you can't do that. I think they did eventually kind of make it a written language after this, but at the time it wasn't. Well, because I was going to say, because they have to write down the language for the military purposes, so I guess they had to figure it out. Yeah, I, that's... That's why they, I think they did, but it's just like they kept saying, it was so complicated. So during the time though, when they're doing the codes, if they said a code word to somebody like, what was one of them? I think shark or something, they would say shark, but, and the person on the other end, they would write it down actually in English versus like writing the actual word in their own language. They write it in English. So Philip Johnston was the guy who presented the Navajo language to the U.S. Marine Corps. He was a World War I veteran and was raised on Navajo reservation. He was one of very few non-Navajo who can speak the language fluently. Philip believed that Navajo could satisfy the military requirements for an undecipherable code. Its complex syntax and phonology and numerous dialects made it un intelligible to anyone without extensive exposure and training. Many Navajo men also enlisted shortly after Pearl Harbor and eagerly wanted to contribute to the war effort. So Philip staged tests under simulated combat conditions, which demonstrated that Navajo men can encode, transmit, and decode a three-line English message in 20 seconds versus the 30-minute requirement by machines at the time. The idea then was accepted by the Marines, and they recruited 200 Navajo. The first 29 Navajo recruits attended boot camp in May 1942. I thought that was pretty cool. Very, very interesting. I didn't realize that the Navajo language at the time didn't even have um, a written language for recruitment. In the beginning of 1940, the army recruited Kamaji, Choctaw, Hopis, Cherokee, and other Hopi. Hopis, I'm sorry, <laughs> and others to transmit messages. The army had special American Indian recruits working to find Kamachis in Oklahoma who would enlist. The Navajo Code was developed. The Marine Corps established a code talking school. As the war progressed, more than 400 Navajo were eventually recruited as code talkers, and the training was very intense. Following their basic training, the code talkers completed an extensive training in communication and memorizing the code. I can't believe that, honestly. I know that they also had like a little booklet, I think, to help them memorize it, but they weren't allowed to take it out to the field, obviously. So I'm sure that was, I had tons and tons of codes in there. Some code talkers enlisted were drafted and many of the code talkers who served were underage and had to lie about their age to join. Ultimately, there were code talkers from at least 16 tribes who served in the army, the Marines, and the Navy. There's one guy who was quoted, they, we were drafted, they made us go, I didn't volunteer. That was Franklin Shupla. He was a Hopi code talker. And the, um, there was an interview with the National Museum of the American Indian interview. And that's where he said that. I thought that was interesting. I thought everybody volunteered. One of the interviews I watched, Peter McDonald, he said that sometimes they didn't have like a word or something. And even like during combat or during, you know, when they're out there in the field, they would just kind of make up something that the other person could possibly understand what they're trying to say. Yeah, the part in the movie where they have them all in the classroom and he's, um, Adam Beach, or uh, Yazzie, is trying to come up with the word for tank that's actually, like, pretty close to what re- they really did is that they pretty much had to, re- they had since, like you said, it wasn't a written language, so they had to pretty much just 
relate everything, even like letters in the alphabet. They had to relate like every alphabetic character to like an animal or something like that. So because you know how they say like alpha, bravo, that type of thing in, in, in the military, they had to, you know, relate it to, you know, eagle for E, dog for yeah. D or whatever. So they pretty much had to relate every like military term to something they already knew and had a word for, but didn't necessarily have a written word for. I just had a kind of a little quick fact that kind of goes with what Lisa was talking about, which I thought was kind of interesting because they, in the movie, they just focused on the the Pacific side of the war but they actually had like different tri- different tribes and different well different nations assigned to a bunch of different regions in the war which they don't really talk about in the movie i don't believe so i had that the navajo and the and the hopi were assigned to service in the pacific and the war against japan the comanches fought the germans in europe and i've never heard of this nation before but the mez Ms. Quackies, Ms. Quackies, I don't know, fought them, um, fought them in North Africa. So they actually had quite a few tribes um, in various locations throughout the war, which I didn't know that they like had specific, you know, people assigned to different, different regions, which is kind of cool. Okay, so now I want to talk about why the code was so important to the war. As Lisa already mentioned, that code talkers that used Native American language was not new to World War II. It was also used during World War I in France, and it was obviously successful. However, during World War II, America was a little reluctant to use it again because Germans were infiltrating tribes, as Lisa again also said, to try and learn the language. But the speed and accuracy to relay messages convinced skeptics to support the program. The Navajo code talkers were successful because they provided a fast, secure, and error-free line of communication by telephone phone and radio during World War II in the Pacific. The 29 initial recruits developed an unbreakable code and they were successfully trained to to transmit the code under intense conditions. The code they created was done so well that not even other Native Americans who spoke the language could understand the code. My mind was blown by that for some reason. As I've already said, it was just like very interesting that they could make a language that's already kind of hard for others to understand even more like undecipherable. Code talkers were present at many important battles, including at Utah Beach during the D-Day invasion in France and at Iwo Jima in the Pacific. The six code talkers during the five-week battle for Iwo Jima sent over 800 messages without a single error, which again is, I think, pretty crazy cool. In fact, 5th Marine Division Signal Officer Major Howard Connor stated, were it not for the Navajos, the Marines would never have taken Iwo Jima. When the American flag finally was raised on Iwo Jima, the first news went out in Navajo code. By the end of the war, it was estimated that there was 400 code talkers, which is a I think a significant amount considering they started off with 29. Can I just say one thing? I think that's super interesting and that there was zero failures with the codes, right? That it just was successful every single time. Didn't I feel like they didn't show enough about that. Like I feel like that would have been way interesting to like learn about that in the film. And I don't know. I think the film was more just a war movie than it was actually trying to like teach anybody anything about history. When I was watching the movie and the guys like screaming to the radio and the other guys listening, I'm like, how do you guys hear each other? How do you guys know what you're saying? Like that was what I was interested in too. Exactly. I mean, they even said earlier, or one of us said about how they were trained to do it in intense conditions. Obviously, that's like what all like military training is, but it's just like, like you said, you have to hear and you have to kind of keep a level head, especially being surrounded by people dying and stuff like that in order to make sure that what you're listening to is correct. Um, so like I was saying, his orders consisted of him having to kill Yazi if he were to be captured because the code was that important. So was this true? Perception, I guess, is reality in this situation. There are many code talkers who believed that this was a reality for them. But in reality, at least according to the Marines, this was false. So obviously, again, there's multiple sides to it. The code talkers were, of course, important. And as we see in the film, how they were mistaken. I think, Lisa, you also mentioned this, how they were kind of mistaken for their Japanese enemy. So they did have bodyguards at first. I believe it was just kind of them watching out for each other and having each other's back. But then they were actually assigned someone to kind of look out for them and make sure you know, nothing happened to them. Um, One code talker said he heard from other code talkers. So basically it's like a game of telephone. They were all hearing each other. They're all kind of spreading this rumor around um, that the bodyguards were told, quote, if a code talker was captured to shoot him. However, no direct orders were ever given and the Marines have always denied they would ever give orders for one Marine to kill another. This story, again, seems to be one that has circulated amongst the code talkers. Um, One code talker also claims to have heard it from one of the bodyguards. So again, it's just like, one person kind of hearing it from yeah. another, but it's the I mean, he said. 
Exactly. He said, he said. He said, he said. But I mean, I kind of, I don't know. I was thinking about it. I was like, what if this was something that maybe someone heard from a bodyguard, but maybe that because of the whole racial tensions between them, maybe they were kind of doing it as like a sick prank to each other. Or I don't know. Maybe it was true. And, true. Yeah. I, I was like, maybe it was true. And, and obviously the Marines are going to be like, yes, we told exactly. people to do this or whatever. So I don't know. At this point, it's, it's not really known. But because I mean, some code talkers say that they heard that just from each other like no one actually told them but again even in the film we see that they had these orders but they were not even told to tell the other bodyguards like they couldn't tell anybody their orders so who knows well because i think the navajo would get paranoid and i don't think that they wouldn't trust them exactly so i think it makes sense why they the navajo should shouldn't know about this secret task that needs to be done I do believe that was an order that was given because it just makes sense. Because even when I was doing my research for it, I could not find anything really about like whether or not this was true. And of course, some people, are, like some articles I found did say like for sure this is what happened, but it's like they didn't have any sources to kind of back up what, how they found that information out. And I feel like that was kind of the main common theme when people were talking about it online is that they could not find any concrete evidence because obviously, you know, obviously there isn't going to be any concrete evidence of that. Just what code talkers had heard basically is what the evidence is. But I mean, we'll only just have our speculations. And they're lucky that they actually didn't have to do that. They said that that never was done on the field, Mm -hmm. right? So that was wrong in the movie. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to ask you guys a quick question. Okay, so when they were giving, when the one guy was giving Nicolas Cage his orders about this and to protect the code at all costs and all that stuff, at that point, did you guys get the feeling that that's what he meant? That, you know, you may have to kill him if he gets captured? Because I felt like when they had Christian Slater pull out the gun on White Horse, that it was supposed to be some big reveal, but it's just like, I already knew that he was going to have to kill him. Like, I felt like they kind of like started to like sneak it in, like hint it. Well, I feel like it was supposed to be revealed to White Horse kind of thing because they didn't know about it. We knew about it as the viewer, but he didn't know about it as his character. As I just mentioned, the racial tensions. So what was racism that the Navajo Mm -hmm. experienced actually like? So, I mean, we briefly mentioned, or I briefly mentioned earlier, the character of Chick. He was a white guy, a white Southern guy. (laughs) And he seemed to be, I mean, at at one point, him and Yazi get in a fight near the river saying that he looks Japanese and, oh, sorry, I mistook you for, you know, Japanese, whatever. He's supposed to protect the code at all costs. Yeah, excuses. (laughs) Well, he isn't. He's not the bodyguard. Oh, that's right. He's like a private or something. Yeah. So they have him as like the main like racist guy. But when I was looking into it, I couldn't really find anything really on like in like in service in combat racism really between like a- actual marines or actual soldiers i could only really find racism that they faced like in in the 40s and years prior to that before they were drafted or enlisted so i got a lot of my info from the national museum of the american indian After World War II, uh, most American Indian code talkers returned to communities that were having difficult economic times. Jobs were scarce, and so were opportunities for education or job training. Racism towards Indian people was common, and even though they had served a country with distinction, Indian veterans could not eat or drink in some establishments or even vote in some national or state elections. To overcome these challenges, code talkers had to be as as resourceful as they had been during the war. So on either end they face racism but i just like couldn't really find anything during so um they actually mention well actually there's this whole aside when they're in the japanese village between yazi and um what's his name joe joe enders they have this moment where joe uh draws the catholic church in the flower on the table and yazi says oh i was raised catholic because you know he had to go to an english school which happened a lot i mean not not even just with from my research not even just with native americans they did the same with cajuns in louisiana and stuff they did the same thing where they'd force them into english schools and essentially what yazi said was true was that they were forced to speak english when they were at school 
Um, they could not speak Navajo or whatever their dialect was, or they'd be reprimanded, you know, slapped with a ruler or, you know, something more serious. Like he said, he was strapped to a boiler for two days. So they were very adamant about them not actually using their language and that, which is obviously kind of silly and ironic because they later needed to use the language to help America, which... I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get into my feelings on Native Americans in America because obviously I feel like they they were wronged and continue to be wronged and it's ridiculous. But um, can I just say quickly too? Because you know how they were in these schools, isn't that a part of the reason why a lot of their languages are kind of almost dead now because of they were forced yes. to speak these languages and weren't they exactly. also separated from their families so that way they couldn't communicate with each other? I feel like that's something I learned like years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that I feel like the separation from families, I feel like that was a pretty early on thing. But yeah, I feel like that. Yeah. When they first put them into the schools and stuff. Yeah, they separated them and they sent the kids because obviously it's easier to what's the word indoctrinate children than, Mm -hmm. you know, adults. So yeah, they would send them away to these English schools and they would, you know, teach them Christian religion and, you know, force them to speak English and all of that stuff. But yeah, there are quite a few native languages that obviously are dead now and um, kind of silly side thought <laughs> back um, back at the beginning of this I thought that I was you know really going to learn another language so I downloaded Duolingo on my phone and I'm like I have they have too. Navajo on there they have Navajo oh, yeah. on, on Duolingo Jesus, so just I was like, me that too. yeah I was real adamant that I was gonna like learn Navajo and I did it for a couple weeks but man it's hard yeah it, well it, Chase it, was saying that they added that because we do Duolingo as well and mm-hmm. he said they added it because they're trying to encourage people to learn a lot of these dead languages so that people, you know, so that they don't die. <laughs> yeah, which is super cool. I mean, um, where I live in Northern California, we have three or four tribes up here. And um, they, it's like relatively recently, they uh, now have classes at the college so that people can learn Yurok and stuff like that, which is super cool because, I mean, a lot of, I mean, and, a lot of the elders in the tribes are dying and they're the only people that know the full language. And it's, and I don't know if it's just the, because they, they feel like, which I feel like this happens with Spanish too, where it's just like, Oh, you know, I don't want to teach it to you because you should know English. And this is how you have, how you can get by type of a thing. Because I feel like a lot of is it second generation family, like a lot of older Spanish speakers, they feel like, Oh, I don't want to teach it to my children because we're in America and this is why I came here. And you need to, we want you to speak English type of a thing. We don't want you to be at a disadvantage. Like we are only knowing Spanish type of a thing so I don't know it's like a combination of that and just I feel like disinterest in in the younger generation that they just don't care too much and they'd rather be I get I want to say westernized but at the same time it's I guess it would just be more be Americanized because they were always in the west but like you know they just they don't feel like it's worth their time so it's definitely cool that there's this all this resurgence in interest in learning these languages because you know it'd be really unfortunate for something as important as this is with like the code talkers and stuff for it to just completely die out. I was actually just having this conversation with my mom yesterday because we were uh, driving up to Crescent City. And as you are driving through Humboldt up to Del Norte County, you and like through Cl- through Klamath and stuff, there's a lot of the, the rancherias and the reservations up there and just how many tribes we have up here. And I'm just like thinking, I'm just like, man, I mean – not to be one of those people, but I did one of those 23 and me's. No, I mean, I already knew that like I was Native American somewhere in there, but a part of me didn't, I don't know. I wanted to be justified in my, because there's a lot of people obviously that are just like, oh, I'm Native American. I'm Cherokee, blah, blah, blah. But it's just like, I actually wanted to find out so that I could stop like, you know, saying that I was if I wasn't. And I mean, I am. And like two percent it's not nothing super exciting but like I was just like talking to my mom about this because I was just it's kind of like the thing where it's just like oh the older generation type of a thing like it's through my grandfather who's passed now so it's like if I want to learn more about it or do anything about it it's like I really need to get in touch with my grandma and like you know figure out the Dawes role and everything because that's how um the Cherokee and the Creek Nation do it it's like you have to have a relative on the Dawes role which was in the 
I want to say 20s, I believe, which basically was like a census of all of the native peoples in the area at the time. So it's like if you're on this census, then it's like obviously you were a part of the tribe type of a thing. And it's just like, man, if I care this much, which I really do, I really want to like learn more about this and like be less be less boring but no i mean the traditions are especially again with the indigenous people's day that was recently and there was like a resurgence and like oh this you know this tribe this tribe this tribe it's so interesting like culturally and it's just like i wish that like americans cared more i guess it's just like i wish it was more prevalent just native in mainstream media and stuff like that i don't know i just wish that they taught it more in schools especially because we're in california i feel like they really didn't talk too much about it i mean like they talked about the missions but it's just like that's a, a crummy way to talk about it because it's just like the missions aren't good history <laughs> so it's like I kind of wish that like oh instead of being assigned oh a, a mission that you had to like make a diorama of the mission and learn about it or whatever I wish like oh you were assigned like a tribe or something and you have to learn more about the tribe like I feel like that would just be way more useful because you know as unfortunate it is that uh, numbers in these nations are dwindling it's like we need to learn more about these people that were here first I definitely agree. I think it's just, I don't know what it is, why people don't care about cult, different cultures or anything like that. But it's just like, it's just so interesting. Like even just like other places, I'm like, dude, especially, I think that's why when I was younger, I was so intrigued by it because I never knew anything about it before. And I didn't even know these types of things like existed in like, you know, a long time ago before we even got here. And it's just weird that people don't consider that to be part of the history of America. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, that's yeah. a part of the history of America to learn about Definitely. the people that were here before us. I don't even know if it's just like the fact that I feel like Canada is just a better and cooler place than um, the United States. <laughs> but even like Canada, they call their native peoples, they call them like first nations people or first people. And it's just like, yes, they were first. They were here first. And it's just like, and we call them Indians and Native Americans. It's just like, no, they weren't Native Americans. I mean, I guess to the continent of America, but it's just like, no, they're, no. <laughs> I, don't know. They I think it's just credit. one of those things where people don't, people just like to ignore things and not like face anything head on. So in order to acknowledge people, People that were here first I feel like they have to acknowledge other things and they don't want yeah. to acknowledge those things so they're like okay let's just forget about all of it then so definitely mm -hmm. which I mean we'll get into later with the recognition for sure so anyway back to the <laughs> our tangent <laughs> that long side note <laughs> side note um, okay so back to the racism they faced when they came back which again will lead into their recognition and late recognition. War was hard on the entire American economy. Food and gasoline were rationed and many basic items were in short supply. After the war, many returning veterans found it difficult to find jobs. Most American Indian reservations and communities are located in rural areas where there are few jobs even during normal economic times. Unemployment and poverty levels had long been high for American Indians, but it was even worse after the war. Life was very difficult for many World War II American Indian veterans. Some of the returning code talkers stayed in their home communities and farmed, ranched, fished, and did whatever kinds of work they could find, which they kind of mentioned with White Horse. He had like the biggest flock of sheep, I guess, in the, in the nation. Others had to move to larger urban areas where jobs were more plentiful. Many veterans took advantage of the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, which is now better known as the GI Bill, uh, to go to college and get vocational training. The Code Talkers accomplished many things during their post-war lives. Some became leaders in their communities and participated in the tribal governments. They became educators, artists, and professionals in a variety of fields. Uh, others were more active in the cultural lives of their tribes. Some, some worked to help pr preserve their languages. Teddy Draper Sr., a Navajo Code Talker during World War II, spent years teaching the Navajo language at the DNA College in Arizona. Racism has long been an obstacle for American Indian people to overcome. The Indian Citizen Act of 1924 granted full United States citizenship to all American Indians. However, some states still refused to let American Indians vote. Not until 1948 in Arizona and New Mexico and 1957 in Utah could American Indians vote in those states. So I had a quote here uh, from Sam so who was a Navajo code talker after I came back back home still no job no work so back to the railroad again I worked on the railroad and found out they were only sh short time jobs went to Haskell Institute in Lawrence Kansas took a course in refrigeration and electrical wire house wiring it was just 
rough pretty much when they came back. Yeah, that must be really tough because you have such an important job out in the field and you come back and you're exactly nobody. Yeah, exactly. Which happened quite a bit. I mean, isn't that like the entire plot of Rambo, I think, where he comes back from. Oh, my gosh, I'm totally blanking. I'm thinking of Gaston. Because he's like this war hero and he comes back and he's like, I'm amazing, I'm amazing. Everyone's like, <laughs> Oh, okay, I Vietnam, Vietnam War. Sorry, I just remembered. Yeah, the whole plot of Rambo, isn't it? The, like where he comes back from the Vietnam War, but the people were so against, I mean, in the time of v- the Vietnam War, people were so against the war that there was like this 50 50 split of people who wanted to recognize and, you know, people for being in the service but at the same time they didn't agree with this war so they saw him as you know a killer and a murderer type of a thing and i don't know it's just like it seems like there's always just kind of it really just comes down to personal opinion i feel on how you feel about war at all so it's just kind of like there are some people that are recognized as heroes and then a lot of the time it's just like no you did all of that but it's done now and i don't care and I don't know. It's unfortunate. I will get into right now as to why they weren't recognized, (laughs) at least in this instance. So many code talkers earned medals, such as Purple Hearts, Silver Stars, Good Conduct Medals, and Combat Infantry Badges during and after the war. But this was recognition that many servicemen and women received, depending on where they were and what they did in the war. Special recognition for code talking would not come for more than 40 years. One reason that code talkers were not recognized until much later is because the program was secret and classified by the military. The Navajos were ordered to keep their wartime jobs secret. It wasn't until 1968 that Navajo code talker program was declassified by the military. The military did not order the Comanche code talkers to keep silent about their jobs in the war. However, mostly due to security concerns, the program was not discussed outside the Comanche community. Speaking on the secrecy, Chester Nez, who was a Navajo code talker, says when we got out discharged they told us this thing that you guys the thing that you guys did is going to be a secret when you get home you don't talk about what you did don't tell your people don't tell your parents family don't tell them what your job was this is going to be a secret don't talk about it just tell them you were in the service defend your country and stuff like that but the code never never don't mention don't talk about it don't let people ask you try to get that out of what you try to get that out of what you guys did and that was our secret for 25 26 years until august 16th 19 1968. That's when it was declassified. Then it was open. I told my sister, my aunt, all of my families what I what I really did. He was, was like, crazy. guys. <laughs> yeah. Hey, guess what? I can tell you now. I know. <laughs> you thought that I did this? Well, it was cooler. <laughs> Let me tell you. I've been keeping Man, this secret for years. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, that's and I mean, it's just like kind of goes back to like you don't learn about this type of stuff. So it's like so cool that this was so important and their job was so important. And then like having to just hold it in and be like, no, what I did was so much better than that. Let me tell you, please. <laughs> the overdue recognition. After the programs were declassified, people started to realize the importance of the Code Talkers achievements and recognition finally began to arrive. In 1989, the French government awarded the Comanche Code Talkers the Chevalier of the National Order of Merit, a very high honor. Finally, in 2000, the United States Congress passed legislation to honor the Navajo Code Talkers and provide them with special gold and silver congressional medals. The gold medals were for the original 29 Navajos that developed the code and the silver medals for those that served later in the program. A statement in the Navajo language on the back of the medal translates to, with the Navajo language, they defeated the enemy. So this was from George W. Bush, who was president at the time. Gentlemen, your service inspires the respect and admiration of all Americans, and our gratitude is expressed for all time. In the medals, it is now my honor to present. Uh, It says that in 2007, a a congressional bill that will officially recognize all American Indians who served as code talkers during the 20th century. So they're actually, I'm assuming it passed, is a congressional bill to recognize all of these folks. Beyond Washington, D.C., tribal governments, some state and local governments, and a variety of organizations have acknowledged the importance of the code talkers. Like all veterans, code talkers receive certain benefits for their service. For example, if a wound has physically disabled them, they're eligible for financial assistance from the government. Sometimes this kind of help is more important to the veteran than the medal, obviously, which I feel like they they kind of bring up in the movie because Nicolas Cage gets that medal on the spot and he really pushes for that guy to give it to Yazi too. And he's just like, good job, and walks away. And it's like, that's 
mean. <laughs> but I mean, Nicholas Cage obviously is like, oh, I'm too hardcore for medals and they don't mean anything and you know, gives it away to somebody who's past and gives, tells him to send, Mar- tells Mark Ruffalo, Mark Ruffalo, we haven't mentioned him yet. He's in the movie, tells Mark Ruffalo to send it to the <laughs> guy's family. <laughs> okay, this one, the quote from John Brown Jr., who was a co-talker. Oh, yes, I'm proud of it, particularly, particularly when I shook hands with President Bush in Washington three years ago. He gave me the gold medal. He shook hands with me, and then afterwards I spoke. So I spoke in English, and then when I got through with my speech, I spoke in Navajo. It amounted to about three minutes. I said, you Navajo people that are now on the reservation between the four sacred mountains, I want the, I want the people – or the people should thank you for using our sacred language. This language was given to us by the holy people. I don't know how many thousand years ago, I said, we use it for they to help win for the United States. Which is like, yeah, you did. <laughs> and then I had one, one more quote from uh, Sam so who I had earlier. What I want to do is thank the whole people of America, the citizens. I learned that they are my people too. For those that give us recognition, recognition through my travel, most of the Anglo- yeah, it's Anglo, Anglo-Saxon, yeah, Anglo people, really show appreciation that how we contribute to the Second World War, and I really deeply thank them for their recognition. So, I mean, I feel like John Brown kind of had a bit of a slight there. And then the very last thing that I had was, which I didn't know about this because no one talks about anything ever when they should, that the U.S. has recognized August 14th as Navajo Code Talkers Day. That's already come and gone this year, but that's cool <laughs> to know for future reference. Yeah. I feel like there's like this stereotype and this like generalization that a lot of these nations, these, these tribes all have casinos. So they're all rich because of the casinos and all that type of thing. Cause I mean, native, the Indian casinos here is a, it's a big deal, but it's just like not, not unfortunately you know, due to numbers and the way, you know, they were compensated um, by the government and stuff like that. Not every, not every tribe is in a great position, like you said. So it's just kind of like they continue to be troubled. I mean, it's alcoholism is unfortunately a, a, a big problem with tribes and just general mental health and depression, which is unfortunate. And, and so it's just kind of like, I don't know, I wish, I, yeah, like you said, it's just like, I wish that they were more recognized and, and um, I guess held up, I don't know, like, mm-hmm. just like uplift, I guess, people. And it's just, yeah, it's unfortunate that there are these stereotypes that, oh, they're doing so well because of gambling and all, all the reservations are awesome and they're getting money from, like, there's like, I mean, even here, like I said, we have so many tribes here in Northern California that there's like this like stupid like, stereotype and, and thought that, you know, oh, because of, you know, they're, they're getting compensation from the government all the time. Like, oh, we don't need to help them. Or like there are some, um, bills and laws trying to trying to be passed here just so that they could get better um, health care. And a lot of the comments on these articles is just like, oh, why should we help them? They, you know, they already get compensated by the government and all this stuff. And it's just like, no, that's not even true. It's just like, uh, it's just so sad. I think it's just also messed up too, because again, how we don't hear about these things, but especially the certain battles that, that they were a part of, like the whole D-Day thing and all that. It's like, you don't hear about the, because they were a bit vital, at least from what I what I read in my research to these battles and their success, yet we do not hear about it. I feel like, I feel like I do not hear about it whatsoever in the role that they played. And it's just not right. You know, people I think need to be aware of the fact of why certain things were successful. And instead it's just like, yeah, it's whatever. Like we did it because we're awesome or I don't know what the hell it is. But again, it just, it's just people need to be aware of what's going on and what the reality of certain situations are and why things are successful. And I feel like because they're unaware of that, that's why also people do not respect or see the value of certain, you know, like languages or anything like that, because they only have the linear idea of what it is. They don't see the importance that these people and their language have held for our nation. And, you know, we, we probably wouldn't be like where we are now without these certain things happening in our history, but people don't care. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, America needs to kind of go through their history lessons or what are they called? Criteria. It, yeah, it's, it's insane. It's really insane. I feel like I learned more about European history 
it, yeah. than I did about any – and it's like, look at this. This is something I could have learned. It's totally about America, and we didn't learn anything about it. Mm-hmm. It's kind of one of those things. I can't remember which episode it was, but it's kind of – or Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that's what it was, mm, or I'd yeah. mentioned that. It's just like unless you are studying that topic, like there's really – you're not going to learn about it in school. I think it would be more respectable for us to be like, yeah, at the time he was great and it was great, but we are now looking at it and it's not great. And we don't want to continue to celebrate that. And we would like to continue, we would like to start celebrating this. Like I would have 10 times more respect for our leaders and people in our country to accept that versus just, let's just continue to celebrate this because we have for so many years. Thanks for joining us this week on The Internet Historians. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and what, a Google Podcast. Like, what's the other? Um, Google Podcast and give us a rating. We would also love to connect with you. So give us a follow on Instagram where we give sneak peeks into the subjects of our episodes. Next week, oh, and we also have YouTube as well. Next week, we'll be discussing Harriet Tubman from the movie Harriet Tubman. So don't forget to tune in. Thanks again, and we will see you next week. Bye. Bye.